Well, we have Jason Perro on the line. Jason, thank you so much for uh, being on the show. And we got a lot to cover here today. So I'm just going to throw it right to you right off the bat. Have you introduce yourself to our listeners. All right. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Jack. I'm really happy to be here today and I and, uh, appreciate what you do. Yeah, you have a great show and I think that people get a lot of value out of it. Um, my name is Jason Perro, uh, born and raised near Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, my wife and I have been buying real estate for almost 20 years. So since 2001, um, actually closed our first property a week before 9-11. Um, and uh, we, we started out with small properties like duplexes, single family homes, and um, currently have uh, 900 units um, that we own. We've, we've owned 600, syndicated 300. We um, closing on another 130 in the next month. So that'll put us over a thousand units um, all in our own market. So again, a good portion of what we own is just my wife and I, no partners. And then we've, we've syndicated and joint ventured some, some property as well for the sure. remainder. So, uh, you know, you've been in this business now for 20 years. You've with nine 11 and 2008 and everything. And now we have the, the topic on everybody's mind is the coronavirus and, and the uncertainty of what's going on in the stock market. Um, with your experience, what do you think? Like, uh, is everybody, should we all be panicking? Like, it seems like we better all run out and get that toilet paper and, and hunker down and, and not buy anything right now, right? No, I, I mean, we, we talked about this a little bit in the, in the pre, pre-interview conversation that, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes the nation just needs something to, panic about I, I would uh I, I listened to a podcast the other day with with an infectious disease expert that's internationally known and you know uh, he's on the joe rogan podcast and I, I, his name is michael i, I can't remember yeah, how i listened to, to that one too yeah yeah and i think he had said like joe, you know something about you know in terms of freaking out you know on a scale of one to ten you know um of one being like you don't care and a ten being like oh my god the world's falling like you know, be aware, be vigilant, maybe be at a four or a five. I mean, if you get sick, don't go and get other people sick. Like, you know, don't, um, this might be a good time to like really notice how, how much we don't wash our hands and that during any flu season. And, and this sounds like it's pretty bad. I mean, it sounds like, you know, there are people dying and there's people that are going to get sick and not get better, but, um, you know, that's not a reason to panic. Um, y- you know, there's, uh, it, it could be really bad, but, you know, the, the good news is the majority of most people will, will recover and it's sort of a short term disruption to our, to our life. But, you know, um, going back, you know, we, we bought our first property, we closed the week before nine 11, mm-hmm. you know, but kept buying property and buying property. Um, 2008 came, um, and went, and that was a tremendous opportunity to buy distressed and undervalued property. Um, and just all sorts of cycles, you know, we've been through Republican administrations, democratic administrations, and, um, honestly, I think you just, you just have to adapt. I mean, things are going to always change and there's always going to be the way our way of life changing and how we do things. But, um, I'll give you an example of, um, sort of at least how, why I'm still bullish on real estate. Mm-hmm. Um, we have an offering that we're putting out of 127 units in, in Erie, Pennsylvania. That's where I'm from, uh, that we're going to, we're putting an offering out on and just finishing up the offering memorandum. So I sent a little teaser email this morning at 9.30 to all of our previous or current investors and said, hey, look, we're going to let you get first dibs at it. We'll send out the OM either tonight or tomorrow. But here's the process. If you want to give us a soft commitment, we need that by Monday because by Monday afternoon, we're going to be sending out, uh, you know, we're going to be talking to, to our newer investors. And we need to raise $2.2 million, And by noon, we had already gotten $1.3 million in soft commitments. So, um, without anybody seeing the OM, so I think, you know, sometimes in, in, if, if you do a good job at educating your, your investors, if you're in, in, in a, say syndicating, um, and these are people that are accredited and some just sophisticated investors, you know, they understand the long-term view of investing. And I think when things are really, un, you know, uncertain, if you've done your job well, you've educated them about the stability of, of real estate and what it really does long-term. So, so I think that, um, you know, People can make, you know, you can be cautious, you can be um, aware of what's going on around you, but don't, fran- you know, don't panic, don't freak out, you know, maybe take advantage of some good buys in the stock market right now. I'm not personally in the stock market, but, um, you know, just take care of your neighbors. I mean, if there's somebody does get sick, like, you know, be, be a good person, but, mm-hmm. you know, don't be a jerk. If you do get sick, leave, leave the house, but don't, you know, but don't freak out. Right. 
Yeah, no, it, it's, you know, it's top of mind. And I thought we, we should broach yeah. that subject, you know, especially when I know that you place a lot of uh, focus on that work-life balance. Yeah. Uh, we, I think we have a tendency of uh, romanticizing the grind and, and getting in front of, uh, of things. And it's, it's all about burning cycles. Um, and in the end, you know, we have this scare going on right now, but we're into real estate and investing to provide a better life for, for our friends or for our family. Yeah. And, and uh, I think we sometimes lose sight of that um, and, and remember and remind ourselves to take a moment and, and enjoy that time with your friend, family. So what, what recommendations or advice do you have there? As far as taking a work-life balance and yeah. not burning a candle on both ends. I, I think, well, <laughs> it'll be interesting. There, there'll be a lot of people that are forced into that, that, uh, that lifestyle right now where they have to work from home. Um, schools are shutting down. You know, my, my mm -hmm. high school um, is, is going to have to, you know, they're going to do school remotely at least through the end of the month uh, starting next week. Just, to, you know, just in an overabundance of caution. And I think sometimes, you know, we get, I was very guilty of this early on. I would just work, 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 grind all hours of the day and, and not really pay attention to what's, what's important. You know, the, the, you know, your, your relationships, your friendships, your health. And so um, I think that that should always be top of mind. So it's hard though, when you're, you know, you're trying to grind and, and achieve this goal of, you know, whatever is building a portfolio, maybe getting enough income to leave a day job or just grow, you know, just, just excel in business. Um, but but at the end of the day, that can all be taken away. I mean, say God forbid you're somebody that gets sick from from this coronavirus and and, and uh, you know doesn't recover, right? You know, mm -hmm. life can be taken away at any time. So so don't take that kind of stuff for granted because you know if you if you bust your tail and, and then you know your spouse or better half leaves you, you know because you're not around, or you know your kids hate you because they don't know who you are because you're working. 20 hours a day right. and you get to balance that stuff out and see what's really important. I mean, a lot of times we'll, we'll say, Hey, I'm working hard so I can build this dream for my family. But if you leave them behind, you know, they don't really, um, you know, they, they're not, they're not going to appreciate all that hard work unless you give, give yourself to it. It doesn't take, you know, you know, you don't have to give 20 hours of your time a day to, to your, your spouse or your best friends or your, you know, or your kids, but you, you know, you have to be present. So when you are with them, you know, 15 minutes of quality time is better than three hours of just sitting in front of your phone, you know, like checking Facebook or whatever, whatever you do. Right. Just right. Time. right. Yeah, no, I, it, it's funny you bring up Facebook because I, I've, well, I suppose it's been well over a year or so now. I just started shutting off the notifications to those social networks because yeah. frankly, there isn't a notification that I receive on those services that need my immediate attention. Right. So right. it'll, it'll, it'll wait when I, when I get around to it. Well, that, and that's the funny thing, you know, people get so, this is a little bit of a tangent, but you know, you can get so fed up with the news because it's the same thing all day, every day. So they'll get their news from Facebook, but it's the same thing. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know that, um, I don't know that either is like super healthy. And, and there was something that um, one of my mentors and uh, businesses said, you know, said to me and, and he said it on his, um, you know, his various books and things like that, but putting yourself on a news diet. So, I mean, I even found myself the other night, the NBA shuts down. I'm a, I'm a huge NBA fan. I'm like sitting there on the couch. I start freaking out, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. and I have a heart condition. So I'm like, oh, I got to pre exit, you know, so you go down this rabbit hole of nonsense. And, and I remembered, I'm like, you know what? You should put yourself on a 10 to 15 minute news diet a day. And, and you know, what's really important will come to you and you need to be aware of what's, what's happening in the world. But at the same time, you know, you're going to miss everything else, all the goodness that's going on and miss, miss the big picture. So I think we've all been inundated with this coronavirus thing that I think if you paid attention for five minutes, you know what to do to prepare yourself. You know enough not to be freaked out or, or if you have symptoms, what you should have to go to the hospital. But if all you're doing is watching Fox or CNN or whatever it is, and, and you're going to be freaked out. And, and, you know, you either think nothing's going on or you think the world's falling, you know, just, just, uh, right. Uh, detach from you know detach from Facebook for a bit detach from you know detach from from cable TV for a bit and just you know live your life and and you know be surprised sometimes at the, at the magic that occurs when you can like walk away and look I, I'm first to admit that I'm guilty of it sometimes I go down that Facebook rabbit hole and you're you know checking on commenting on friends posts and it's, it's mindless and it doesn't really like 
do much for, you know, at least for me, it doesn't do much for my business at all. So it's just a time, time waste. So. Sure. So is this kind of the strategies as your, as your business obviously has been growing over the past 20 years? Do you find that you've had to really enforce or, or take your own advice when it comes to news consumption and social media involvement? And Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I do. And I, I struggle with it at times, but I, I really, um, I really try to detach as much as I can. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read the newspaper more often because I can get the, you know, I can get the news or I'll go online, you know, to, to like, you know, real news sites, not, you know, not Facebook or some opinion site. I just want to see what's happening in the world, see what's happening in my area. And I can, I can read an article, but you know, um, the challenge with, with a lot of cable news and I'm not picking on any, any one or anything, you know, I'm pretty neutral here, but um, tell me what's going on. And then we're going to get opinions from like 20 different people that aren't, Mm-hmm. They, you know, they claim to be experts, but that's the stuff that gets you wound up and, and then you're so you're detached from, you know, your family relationships, your friendships, or, you know, it's just all these things are maybe not important to you living your life and achieving your goals and dreams. And and mm-hmm. so um, I just try to work, you know, I've, I've tried to take the advice that some of my mentors and, and um, people I look, look up to in businesses said to me about, you know, limit the limit the distractions, you know, you don't have to have your nose to the grindstone at all, all, all day long. But, but you can rot your brain with, with, you know, it's true, with certain content or just being in front of a screen all day long. And, and, and so, you know, try to, try to make more human in- interaction as opposed to online interaction and, you know, try to, try to, you know, I mean, some people are news junkies. I mean, my wife's one of them, my friends, I have friends that are, that are, but for me, I just, you know, like I said, the other night, 10 minutes of news and, and I'm watching, you know, I'm stuck watching the NBA shut down and I'm like, I start panicking, you know, and, and then I, I catch myself. And so I think sometimes right. it's hard, you know, because we're all, we're all humans and, and I'm certainly not perfect, but, um, you know, just, I, I think that that helps when you're trying to grow and scale a business is focus on your mindset, focus on, you know, kind of your inner Zen and inner peace. And, and those are the things that are going to get you through the, the ups, the downs and, and the in-betweens. Sure. Well, as your business is growing too, I can imagine that there's a lot more things to do. You, I mean, your time, is is pretty constant i mean it's it's not gonna ebb and flow how have you managed to scale have you been adding to your team what have you done there to to ensure you maintain your your work-life balance yeah you know i and that that was a um it's a great question because that is hard it was very hard for me early on i i I felt like i needed to take you know too much control in certain areas of the business um you know there's a saying and i still believe it that sometimes you know no one will ever care as much as the owner and they'll never do it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they won't do it as well as the owner, but you have to trust other people. You have to find, find those people that can do certain things better than you. And, 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 um, and it's hard, you know, when you're running a small business or a medium sized business, every dollar counts. Um, but I've learned to have faith in hiring ahead that, you know, if I make that investment in people that it's going to free me up to do what really counts. Maybe that's making deals, raising money, um, you know, like, working on my business instead of in the business. And so um, I, I've really tried to look at my hiring and scaling the business as an investment, uh, but it's given me back a ton of free time. So uh, I, I was sharing this with one of my good friends the other day that, you know, we, we were just in Mexico for, for a week in mid February and um, my, our vacations over the years, it's gotten progressively easier. So I had full faith in my team at home that, there was no crisis. There was nothing that, that was going to happen that they had to call me about that. Well, this tenant did this or this tenant did that, that required a whole bunch of attention. Now um, I was able to check in on, on our property management software um, and get the dashboard look of, okay, is there, you know, is there a problem with somebody's tenant payments? Is there this or that? And they could shoot me updates as needed, but it wasn't as though I had to engage for a lot of time but seven, eight years ago, I would find myself sometimes for a few hours a day on vacation. You know, I'd get up before the family or stay up late and I would, uh, you know, I'd spend a lot of time working on the business. So I think the, the power of getting the right team in place almost takes you, you know, um, I don't say it makes you less important. It just allows you to work on the things you're really good at. And for me, you know, I found I love, I love doing deals. I love, um, you know, I love building the business. But, you know, there's people that are like way better at like, systematizing all this, you know, all the potential messes that I create by adding more, more property. So, mm-hmm. you know, so you have to have faith in people and, and get people that are like, you know, for, for me, you know, we're growing. So you want people that are 
growth oriented, positive minded, you know, like um, people that are not afraid to challenge the status quo, but they know their role. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to disrespect you, but they, you know, like they're going to have a free flow of ideas and you're going to allow that so you can drive your business forward. Sure. But, um, but I think that's important. Even if you're looking to buy your first property, I mean, you know, if you have your own little group of friends or, or um, mentors that you look up to in the business, like having people that can encourage you along the way, but also challenge, you know, challenge your assumptions and make, maybe make you think differently about the business. Sure. Do you self-manage all of your units then? Sure do. You know, the first several years, my wife and I did it all ourselves, um, And she'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you too, I was a terrible painter. Like, you don't want me painting your apartment. But we would paint, we would clean, we would do all that stuff. And um, she's good at a lot, a lot of that. I mean, she was, the, you know, she's the handy one, still is. But um, we went from like zero to 23 units from 01 to 05. And then in 05, I bought a 56 unit portfolio. And with that came a maintenance guy. And then my, the light bulb went off like, oh, wow, this, you know, this guy's taken so much off my plate. And then we got a part-time property manager and we just sort of started, you know, building a team, um, which really allowed, allowed me to grow the business. And so that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, and so now, um, and not that all third party managers, there's plenty of great third party managers, but as we built this, you know, big portfolio, um, I felt, you know, I, I would have trouble taking like, like letting somebody else manage that, that at least in our town, the other third party managers don't necessarily own their own units. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, philosophically I had a problem with that. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just a hurdle that I couldn't get over. So now we've built a, you know, we, we've built an animal where we have, you know, a whole crew of maintenance personnel, office staff, leasing agents that rely on this for, you know, for their livelihood. So we feel good about that and we want to continue to grow that. And, and, um, and I think they do a fantastic job. So it's, um, it's not always been that way. I mean, I think it's almost easier to hire to, to um, do a deal than it is to, to build a culture and build a company. Um, you know, we really struggled with that for a long time. And, and, and I think that I'm very proud to say that I think I've got like, a, you know, probably the best it's ever been in terms of, of we've got great people that are, you know, fr from all sides of all sides of it. But we've we've spent a lot of time in learning how to attract and hire and retain quality, uh, quality employees. Mm hmm. Yeah, I was kind of curious about that because a lot of a lot of people will, you know, buy that first one or two or three uh, properties, they'll self manage them at a certain point, though, it becomes a little too much for them. So mm -hmm. then they offload it to a third party property manager. But I'm seeing more and more larger companies now, uh, basically becoming. So I was wondering what was that? Where was that tipping point? But you said your tipping point really kind of happened naturally with the yeah. with the acquisition and getting a handyman going. Yeah, and I think you know some of my um, uh, friends that I, I met through some very various masterminds and boot camps and things like that. Um, you know, some of them had you know they send all they all they do is syndicate. They don't have anything they sell they own, and they're they're also man you know own these things remotely. You know, they might live in Texas and own something in Atlanta, mm -hmm. um, but I've seen it time and time again where a lot of them have had challenges with the third party management. You know, they underwrite a deal and make certain assumptions one way, but when the rubber hits the road and reality strikes, the properties may run a different way under, under a certain management. So I've seen a handful of them either buy a property management company and then, you know, and then they can control it or they built, you know, they bought enough in one market where they can build their own. And, um, and that seems to be going a lot better for them. So I, I don't, um, uh, I've always said self, you know, everybody who can self-manage should, um, I, I don't want to speak in an absolute because it's not always right for everybody, but, um, from just my un unscientific approach and, and the data, I think that, you know, if you, um, you know, if you ha have the patience to be able to, you know, hire good people and, and incentivize them and, and build a system, um, self-management can, can leave more money on the table for you as an owner, mm -hmm. but so it's hard you know, if you have 10 or 20 units it is hard because it is a time suck at times. And, and so that's where I think that grind comes in. So you have to be willing to kind of keep the faith and really decide what you want out of it. That at that point, you know, you may say, hey, I have to grow big enough so I can get that first employee or I got to grow big enough to, uh, um, you know, to, to take the nice chunk to, to a third party manager. So, do you have some tips for people that if, if they do want to self manage that first, let's say they have a 10, 12 units, um, because uh, again, you're one person, you're trying to do all of this. Many of the people that we talk to also have a full-time job. Yeah. 
um, it makes it it makes it difficult. Um, I I was chatting with somebody the other day that um, they uh, they use some online software like Cozy or or what have mm-hmm. you, and when they get um, uh, a request for a repair or something, they they essentially call a handyman and they 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 put um, key code locks on all of the on all of their properties so that they can just pass on the key code send the uh, repairman in directly you know that, so they can do most of what they need to just via phone right right and that's true i think i, I see that a lot with like newer investors where it you know if you buy a, you know it's your first property uh why not just put on a key code right and, and try and make everything automated um and and you, you know you hit on it too i mean if they have the property management software um i mean that's really something that you know we we did it old school for a long time and probably uh, way longer than we needed to, but it used to be pen and paper, Excel spreadsheets, just right. it was nonsense. And, and I would say with the technology we have now, just, you know, I mean, some of the big property management software platforms don't allow you to subscribe until you have a, hit a certain unit count, but like cozy. And I think there's some others that are free or relatively low cost that, mm-hmm. you know, invest in that. Um, also, you know, attend local meetups or RIAs, find, just find other landlords that do it. I mean, some of my best mentors earlier on were, um, you know, were guys that just maybe had 20, 30, 50 units that, you know, had been doing it for 10, 20 years that could give, you know, give me advice on, well, here's how you screen your tenants properly. Here's how you deal with this type of maintenance issue. And, and so, you know, you need people like that to kind of coach you along because a lot of this is, you know, when you're first starting out, there's going to be new situations um, nonstop. I mean, we've been doing this 19 years and there's still something every, every week that, surprises us, uh, be it from a tenant or maintenance or whatever, whatever the case may be. So if there's a local meetup, uh, a RIA, you know, ours, it's a landlord association. Um, you know, it took me a few years, but I, I joined that. I've been president for the last few years of, of the organization. We have 1400 members, but invaluable resources, you know, where they can provide you with a lease and certain forms and documents and, you know, legal support if you need it, you know, if you're going through an eviction or something like that, or have a, a tough, you know, tough tenant question. So I just think, you know, trying to not go it alone. There's so many new investors that say, well, I don't really need to join. I don't think I have the time. But A, it can be, you know, that having that support just makes it that much easier so you don't give up and you don't get, you know, like when you get these frustrations, you can break, you know, break through those, you know, quicker. But it can also be a great source of deals. You know, you might meet people that it becomes a mentor today and then in five years decides he wants to sell his property and, and you're the first person they think of. Mm-hmm. So, you know, since you brought that up, you know, you, you've had almost 20 years of pretty steady success. I mean, you, you especially even in the in those markets, you know, 9-11, 2008, yeah. and it sounds like you've had a pretty steady progression here. What would you attribute to that, that long-term success? And how much was mentorship a part of that? Yeah. I, I think... Um, one of the things with long-term success is that we just failed enough and, and never gave up. So there was there, you know, it's not always been like, you know, sunshine and roses. I mean, there's, there's a lot of days where you're like, man, why am I doing this? Like, you know, none of my mm-hmm. tenants are going well, I've got so many maintenance. How am I going to make this work? But you get those challenges and, and take it back to your why, you know, why did I get in this business in the first place? What was the purpose? And, and I mean, it can be frustrating. There's no doubt about that. And, and we still hit, you know, you still can hit roadblocks and still hit, you know, different things that you need to kind of work through. But, um, so one of that, one of those things is just not giving up. You know, we, I just wanted this bad enough that the times where it was challenging that we just kept, kept going and kept working and trying to, trying to better yourself and work on, work on yourself. And then, um, as I started growing, I would, um, actively, yeah, at the time I didn't really think of it as a, a mentor mentee relationship, but, but now I do. And I still, I seek out mentors and friends in the business and people that I, um, you know, it's not just a one way relationship, people that you, you know, can also add value to. And so whether that's, you know, getting a coach, joining a mastermind, um, creating a mastermind, uh, or just, you know, just finding the, you know, the, the old dogs that have been doing this for 20, 30 years and taking them out for a cup of coffee or a beer or something, and just wanting to pick their brain and talk shop. And, and mm-hmm. I think, you know, real estate seems to be a very giving industry, um, for the most part, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people that, that don't want to give away their secrets and they, they, they have no interest in helping out new investors, but I just see it. Um, you, know, you go to these conferences and there's people that have been doing it for 40 years and they're, they're more than willing to sit down and talk with a, a brand newbie. And, 
um, you, you know, because there's always, you know, they, they knew that when they started out, there was somebody that helped them along. And I think that that's just not, not really talked about enough that people are so afraid to call that guy that has, you know, 500 homes, you know, they're intimidated by that, but you know, you'd be, you know, you'd be shocked at how, how easy it is for people to, um, you know, just, just to reach out and, and take 15, 20 minutes of somebody's time. And, you know, um, I mean, nobody wants to like somebody who's going to like, you know, kind of nag them all the time, but you know, you, you can build some really solid friendships and relationships in this business just by reaching out. Yeah. So, you, you know, with that, you know, I, I found it, it's, it's so important to be around those like-minded people just to help you stay motivated. Are there, can you talk a little bit about that? Because like you said, you, you gotta, there's going to be some ups and downs and, and you're frankly a little delusional if you don't think that's going to be the case. Yeah. What, how, how do you keep in that positive mindset and keep that motivation going? Yeah. So I, um, uh, you, you know, I, I joined a mastermind a couple of years ago. Um, so has, has real estate investors, peers from all across, all across the country uh, meets, you know, three times a year. Um, that's been invaluable. I mean, you just meet these, you know, meet people that are, you know, you some, you might be a little bit ahead on, on some, maybe a little bit behind, but there's this collective, uh, caring and, 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 um, interest in, in helping everybody succeed. So, so that's one thing. The other, the other thing, you know, locally, I have a couple, uh, peers in the business that, you know, we get together a handful of times a year and you know, we'll grab dinner or we'll go for beers or we'll sit at one of our offices and just grab a pizza and, and, you know, we talk about what we're up to and what we need help with. And, um, and it's as crazy as it sounds. I mean, the first time, you know, if you find that sort of tribe of people that, you know, are maybe, you know, maybe a little bit ahead, maybe a little bit behind where you're at, but, um, you build those friendships. Um, everybody's invested in your success. And, you know, some, sometimes just somebody saying something, saying the same thing a little differently and you've heard it a thousand times before that causes you to think about a situation differently or causes mm -hmm. you to jump to action. So, um, you know, I, I try to spend, you know, it's not an inordinate amount of time. I mean, some people are seminar junkies and, and, and they're always traveling to the, I, I can't do that. I have a business to run. I've got a wife and kids and, and I have a social life. You know, I, I don't, mm -hmm. I can't go to conferences like every month or, you know, let alone, you know, even too many times a year, but I try to pick some, you know, try to pick one or two events a year that, you know, you can network and meet people, maybe learn, you know, learn a few things. Um, but even locally, if you can't travel and get away, just, just meeting other people that are in the business and becoming friends with them and be surprised at how fast that those relationships build, but how fast your own development occurs just by trying to make, you know, cause a lot of people are in the same boat, you know, you might meet, you know, have five units and meet somebody else who has five or 10 units and you're both trying to build your portfolios and, and, you know, and leave your day jobs and be amazing, you know, be, be amazed at like what people like that can learn from each other and then just double or triple their, or triple their business in, in a shorter amount of time. Sure. So, you know, in your market, I, I find this really fascinating that you've done most of this in your backyard, like you have the, yeah. the, because most indications and most people seem to feel like they have to spread themselves thin across the whole U.S. or even other parts of the world to do what you're doing. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and the benefits, the drawbacks? The um, Well, the benefit, on one hand, is the drawback is that you're close to, close to everything. So, yeah. um, but you have a tendency of wanting to drive by and check things out. But that's okay. I mean, but you have to learn to embrace that, right? If something's not right, then you need to address it and, and handle it and, and, uh, and move on. But, um, you know, I, I, when we started out, I didn't know any differently. I bought a duplex the next year. It was a four unit, the next, you know, and then a two unit and then a seven unit and a four unit. And it was just, I didn't know any differently. I didn't think like, well, why would I go buy something, you know, in Chicago when I can buy property in Erie at a, at a relatively affordable rate that cash flows. And so, the people I knew and saw what they were doing, they were just buying in Erie. And then um, as we grew, there's still opportunity. I mean, we're potentially running out of opportunity on the types of property that we want to buy. Mm -hmm. um, so I know what market we're going to move into when we, you know, when we do um, move out of Erie. Um, but, you know, to invest in your own backyard, I mean, with or without investors, you know, the thing is if something goes wrong, I mean, maybe you third party manage, but if they're not doing their job and you have to get your hands dirty, at least you live relatively close to your property. Right. You know, if I'm buying property in North Dakota. Chances are I'm not, I'm not going to drive there to like take care of, you know, 
right. a ton of issue or something like that. So, um, so there, there's that benefit. You know, the other side is if you're local and you know, you, you just try to make sure the tenants don't have your home address or anything like that because you don't want people <laughs> to show up to your house and paying rent. And, right. You know, or, or in this day and age, if somebody's you know going to go postal, you, know, you don't want anybody you know going crazy. But I think uh, I, th- I think you know there's it's not that it's the only way. I mean, plenty of people are uber successful investing across the country, especially in, in you know the syndication model. Um, but I think that if if you live in an area that can allow you to to have cash flow properties, investing in your own backyard is great. I mean, it doesn't apply to somebody living in San Francisco. Um, you know, to, to invest in their own backyard. So they may have to pick a market they like, but at the end of the day, you know, especially in these like crazy times, people will say, well, how's your real estate doing it? Well, it's, it's fine. You know, we have people that are paying rent and, and, you know, see how that goes in the next couple of months. I mean, if people have to like stay home and aren't getting paychecks, that, that could pose some challenges um, certain areas of the country. But um, you know, it's, at least the values are there. That doesn't fluctuate. Usually if you have a paying customer, like a tenant, they need a, a place to live that usually becomes the priority for, for in terms of their bills and what they need to pay. And, and, and uh, mm. um, so again, that's just one of the other benefits of you know, investing in real estate. But if you, you know, you live close to it, you've just got a better control and better handle on the situation. So, so now that you've grown to the, to the size that you have, can you give us a snapshot of what your, what your typical day looks like? Yeah. So um, I kind of balance it with, you know, doing what I want to do and, and sort of doing what I have to do, but what I have to do, I, I enjoy. And that's sort of how I've designed my, my life and business, but a general weekday, uh, get up, get my kids to school. Um, I will go to the office and, um, check in with all my, uh, managers and the, you know, just to make sure that there, is there anything I need to be aware of what's going on. Um, so I usually kind of have a huddle with them for 15 to 30 minutes. And then I go to the gym and I work on myself and I try to try to be healthy, you know, and, uh, so I spend a few hours at the gym and then I'll usually have a series of meetings when I leave the gym, say for at 10 30 or 11 and I'll, you know, through the rest of the day, I'll have like a lunch meeting or I'll, I'll have um, meetings with, with potential investors. I'll be sourcing deals, whatever the case is, I'll be working on doing deals and then, you know, working, working on the business and figuring out ways that we can be more efficient in, at what we do. So it's taken me a long time to get there, but when I have my, you know, my accountant slash bookkeeper, running reports for me and being able to help me analyze properties and groups of properties in a certain way. Um, so, so then, you know, back, come back to the afternoon, I'll spend, you know, half hour to an hour with my team getting the reports, you know, and I can spend my time analyzing reports and data, <laughs> excuse me. I'll usually pick up my kids from school and then, uh, you know, or if they have practice or something like that, I'll, I'll work into the evening hours, but it's, it's, you know, it's around dinner and things like that. If we're sitting in front of the TV, I can, I can, I can watch a game or I can watch a TV show and I can analyze what I need to and kind of create our punch list or to-do list of the next things, whether it's in terms of an acquisition or just in terms of making our own operations a little bit better. So um, sounds pretty easy now, you know, cause I don't have to like be in it, be in it every minute, just let the you know, hire the people, get the people that can do it better than I can and, and let them run with it. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds it's a better situation anyway, because you mentioned you, you, you don't want to be the one, uh, painting the the units yeah. anymore, right? That's right. Not, not <laughs> the best. That's not the best use of your time. No, and, you know, and and uh, we we've I, Josh and I have chatted about this many times before. You know, uh, focusing on your skills and getting people in place and becoming part of your team that not only uh, do those other jobs well, but they actually enjoy doing them is far more powerful than you trying to deal with it yourself. Exactly. Like some people love paperwork and, and, uh, <laughs> I don't, you know, my, I mean, my desk before would be piles and piles of files and paperwork. And I'm, I'm proud to say I don't have any of that anymore because I have people that really actually enjoy like filing papers and being organized and having everything into a system. Yeah. And sometimes that's what people are born to do. So if you find yourself in that situation where there's all this stuff that's out of control, like hire somebody to do that, get it off your plate and, and move on. Right. So, well, you know, it looks like we're, we went a little bit over than what I promised that I was going to keep you to. Um, but uh, was there any question or anything that we, you wanted to cover that I didn't ask about? No, no, I really enjoyed our conversation. I appreciate you having me on and, and uh, I, hope, I hope your listeners got some value out of it. And, um, you know, and if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to, feel free to reach out. Yeah, where, where would people, if they wanted to be, get in touch, how would they get a hold of you? 
Sure. Uh, they can they can reach me on email. Uh, it's just my name, first name, last name, Jason Paro at yahoo.com. Um, they can connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook as well. And um, I, I uh, will take some you know, 15 minute strategy calls if anybody just wants to hop on and, and uh, have a quick phone call. Um, they, can re, you know, they can schedule with me on calendarly.com forward slash Jason Paro. So, well, I really appreciate your time. This was a great conversation and uh, thank you again. I hope we can do it again. Thanks. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend. And stay yeah, you safe. too.